You wrote a column just recently, actually, about TikTok, and you think it's about TikTok and social media, but it went beyond that to talk about how capricious governments, certainly China, but also the United States are, and how investors have to sort of accommodate that. Absolutely. I mean, what I was really trying to talk about in the TikTok column was the fact that we have this paradox in markets. On the one hand, you have markets soaring on the back of a pretty good short-term economic outlook, a lot of relief about the so-called soft landing, and excitement about the idea the Fed will cut rates later this year. But at the same time, we have really quite unprecedented levels of medium to long-term geopolitical risk and domestic political risk. And TikTok is one example of that in a fairly extreme form because until a couple of years ago, there were a lot of big private capital players who assumed that this was going to be one of the hottest things in the tech landscape. Um, people were talking about it potentially being the most lucrative and profit generating trade that they'd seen for a long time. But, of course, now we know that Washington is considering um, forcing TikTok to essentially be banned if ByteDance, its parent, doesn't sell off um, TikTok um, to an outside player. Um, and so suddenly geopolitical risk has come in and spot the party. And that's a metaphor for what's happening or what could happen in many, many asset classes and in relation to many types of securities going forward. And my concern is that investors are simply not realizing the magnitude of that risk. Jillian, we all know you for your work at the Financial Times, how you've covered international finance for many, many years. At the same time, I want to go back to your original training because I love to talk to you as a social anthropologist. That's where you have your PhD. Apply that, if you can, to investors. What are they missing here? Is it because they're wishing themselves to success and just saying, let's make, make believe there aren't these problems? Is it because it's just too difficult to try to discount this geopolitical risk in China or the United States? I think the key thing investors are missing right now is that if you look back at the second half of the 20th century, that was an era when we saw the rise of all kinds of intellectual tools that were very useful for navigating the world, like balance sheets, like economic models, like opinion polls. And all of those rose on the back of the computer revolution and the fact that it became possible to crunch huge amounts of data for the first time on a large scale. Now, the problem with all of those tools is that although they're incredibly useful, they're only as good as what you put into your model, onto your balance sheet, onto your opinion poll. And what you leave out can sometimes matter enormously. And the story of the last few years is that what has been left out, what's been a footnote in the balance sheet or an externality to the economic model, like medical risk, like environmental issues, like social upheaval, like rapid tech change, or now domestic politics and geopolitics, those issues that were not included in those fancy computerized models are suddenly becoming the model in the sense they're most important. And from a cultural perspective, an entire generation was reared on the idea that if it's not in the model or on the balance sheet, it doesn't matter. And now they're waking up and realizing with a shock that's wrong. That was no surprise to the people who were investing before the eras of model making and balance sheet um, fine tuning, but it is a surprise now because of this cultural pattern. Uh, Jenny, I want to pick up on one thing you refer to as political risk. As we face uh, an election here in the United States, there are elections around the world, but we tend to focus on the presidential one here. And is there a new element of uncertainty in misinformation? Because I know you've done a lot of work on that subject. And there is, by the way, which may task back into TikTok, because that's some of the objections about TikTok. Absolutely. The issue of misinformation is a classic issue which was not appearing on the economist model or even, frankly, on many politicians or political models in the past. Um, and the issue cuts both ways. On the one hand, there really is a very real risk that AI and other types of tech, digital technologies will end up manipulating or meddling with the whole voting process in a way that discredits potentially the outcome in November. The other risk, though, for investors is that fear of that causes some very unpredictable and potentially capricious reactions from Washington that could potentially hurt the tech sector. And what we see in the last year or two is the tech sector boom dramatically on the idea that these extraordinary technological breakthroughs around AI would keep generating more and more profits and enable American business to boom. That may be the case. But anyone investing in tech today has to think about the ways that the growing politicization of tech 
could essentially upend their models and projections for the future as well. And yes, TikTok ByteDance is an extreme case, but it's certainly not the only one at the moment that's out there that investors need to think about. Julian, let me do something that is uncomfortable for you as a journalist to put a crystal ball up in front of us. You're a journalist, you report, you don't predict the future. But based on your experience, how do you think investors will come to adjust to the issues that you're saying? Uh, will, will we develop an Excel spreadsheet for geopolitical risk or will we just have to hedge a great deal more and actually take less risk to begin with? Well, I think that you're already seeing an adjustment process in the sense that you're getting consultancies that handle political risk booming dramatically in a way they weren't two decades ago. At the same time, you're seeing groups like the CFA introducing a much wider set of ideas into the analysis that they do and their educational programs. But at the end of the day, the only way to really hedge or prepare for this kind of geopolitical risk is to do two things. Firstly, study history and realize that your own memory, your own life cycle is very short and it pays to see what people were doing 100 years ago when they face this kind of geopolitical risk without flashy computer models. And secondly, that old adage of diversify, diversify, diversify. And the last point I'll make is that in some ways what we're seeing right now is a back to the future in the sense that anyone after World War II was quite used to the idea the government had a big potentially capricious role in the economy and in the business sphere. After the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions, those ideas fell away. In some ways, we're going back to the idea that government can indeed intrude in companies and the markets with TikTok or anything else. And in many ways, looking back to understand the future is quite a valuable precept to have right now.